Good evening. Welcome to the University of Eastern Finland Smart Cafe. I'm Rosanna Avento and your host this evening. Today we shall be discussing changing ethnicity in the context in the context of emigration and immigration. In simple terms, does and can identity change as people emigrate and immigrate? And we shall also discuss the barriers faced by immigrants from the perspective of immigration and integration policies and practices. We shall also talk about how immigrants preserve their home cultures in various ways. Our experts today are Assistant Professor Olga davidova Minge and Dr. Päivi Armila. Welcome. Um, some of you may have been expecting Dr. Dina Sotkasira with us, uh, but unfortunately due to illness she had to cancel, so apologies for that. Uh, later on in this discussion we shall be joined by Dr. Soheib Khan, who will talk to us about his current photograph exhibition, Women Beyond the Walls. You can see some of the photographs here. Now, during the discussion, you dear viewers are welcome to present questions and comments through Pressimo, whose link you can see on the screen now. So, welcome. Let's get started. So, Olga and Pavi, we're very happy to have you here with us today. And let's start by setting the scene with a few definitions. Pavi, tell us briefly, what do we mean by identity? Okay, and, and thank you for in inviting me here. Um, you asked me to say briefly, and um, you might know that there are some hundreds of, of definitions of, of identity. But I, as a sociologist, think that um, identity uh, can be seen as a kind of capable to, to keep on or to, to tell uh, some kind of coherent narrative of us, of me and, and, and of my disposition to the world, to life. And um, identity also, it can be coherent, it aims to be coherent, but it, it can be changed and it's uh, we, we are somehow presenting ourselves in different ways, in different situations. But identity is also um, given to someone. It's not only done by us, that I define myself, or you, you define yourself somehow. But I also can, or, or people can give identities to other people. I, for example, m might say that you are a nice, um, nice, Russian origin colleague in our university. It's an identity that I give to you. And uh, if I'm lucky, you take it as part of your self-definitions. I don't know. Uh, identity can, can be, or is, uh, can be seen as personal, um, individual, but it's also a collect collective definition. It can, can be connected to us, to them to we, mm -hmm. and I, I think it also can, can somehow, it, it can be linked to all personal uh, pronouns and it can be as a subject and as an object, taken, uh, developing and given. Thank you. Short that, enough. That was very <laughs> comprehensive, yes. thank you. But I'll continue <laughs> from there and I'll ask then, what is ethnicity? Yes. Um, well, you keep on going with quite difficult questions, but um, again I talk as a sociologist. And for, for a social, sociologist, uh, ethnicity is some kind of social construction. It's a political construction um, um, and it's somehow needed for community cohesion. People, um, it's easier somehow to to, to figure a group of people, as a group of people who aim to certain kind of common aims, for example, or goals, if they can create a certain kind of ethnic, ethnic identity of us uh, in a very positive way. Um, but it's a construction and it can be changed. It can also be felt as a, uh, some kind of personal 
uh, understanding of me. And I think um, when ethnic identity is seen and felt as a positive identity, so it's very effective also in, in, in a political sense. Because if you, if you define yourself um, as a, some kind of, for example, as a Finn in a very positive way, so I also can easily follow some rules that are posed to Finns as yeah. people. So, uh, Olga, um, since we're in, we're in Finland, and, and uh, I think that Paivi just brought up uh, what I was going to ask next, and uh, let's start with this construct. What, I what is the Finnish identity, and, and who are the Finns? What is it to be Finnish by identity? Yes. Well, um, of course, again, this is a very, very large field uh, that we can discuss for, for long, uh, but um, like from my perspective, from, from the perspective of my research, what I have done, I have studied uh, this formation of Finnishness within so-called remigration, uh, this process of um, uh, migration of uh, persons of Finnish origin from the countries of former Soviet Union to Finland. And uh, like my operational definition of identity that I, I used uh, within my research was, was this very constructivist one. Uh, and uh, I um, was very much inspired by, by theories and writings of uh, Stuart Hall, uh, who is talking about this discursive identity and uh, uh, strategic identity also. So um, I, as being being immigrant myself also, and as being uh, a part of this migration process also, um, I felt this um, uh, process of formation of identities, Finnish identities, and and Finnishness as ethnicity as um, uh, I would say as imposed quite much by this uh, Finnish discourse, by, by, by Finland, by uh, those who created this, this um, procedure uh, of migration on the basis of ethnic origin. So, um, in different situations where people, people were, they had to present themselves as Finns, and they did it uh, according to their uh, using all these resources that they, ha they had. But um, in case of this remigration, uh, actually, uh, the majority of people who migrated within this, this procedure, they actually had and have mixed backgrounds, mixed origins, as myself, yeah. of course. And uh, in this situation, when you are put um, in this position that you, you, you have to be, you have to present s certain identity to be eligible, to be able, to move mm. to the country. And I, I uh, did my study in, um, in the end of 90s, in the beginning of uh, 2000s, when, when the situation in Russia was very, in Russia, for example, was very, very difficult. And, and there were a lot of people who wanted to migrate uh, to Finland. Of course, they were, uh, first of all, objects of, of, of this discourse of Finnishness. So, um, uh, for me, this um, ethnic identity, identity, Finnishness, they actually, I don't see them as, as um, uh, you know, this very um, positive um, models or positive objects of identification, but 
I saw them, I experienced them uh, as um, this very um, powerful discourse, discourse that was produced from, from the posi uh, position of power. Okay. So um, maybe Paivi, um, as you talk about identities and ethnicities and they being able to change and uh, uh, um, Olga uh, tells us how the, the Finnish identity has come from a position of power and, and imposed on, on, on immigrants. Would an immigrant be in, you know, in any case regarded as having a Finnish identity? Mm, maybe you would ask this <laughs> maybe more wisely, but, uh, but I can try because uh, uh, I think it depends on us because you talk, was talking about power. And uh, if we give some positions, subject positions and, and identities to people, it actually can done also from the position of power. And if, uh, for example, Finnish identity is something that is wanted here, discursively produced as, a, as an aim. Mm. So and I, I think it's also in, um, in, the, in the law somehow said, mm. yes, yes. feeling Finnish identity yes, somehow. Yes. Yes. To be a Finn. Mm. Yes. So um, it depends on us. Mm. It depends so on us. Being a Finn mm. involve Finns like to go to sauna and Finns no. celebrate Johannes, no, no, or no, no, is no. is the Finnishness mm. related also to issues um, that I think you know, that maybe Finland uh, really does promote as issues, for instance, as gender equality and uh, democracy. Um, and, and, and that sort mm. of thing, or what is the Finnishness? Well, mm. If we think that uh, everyone can, could somehow uh, talk him or herself inside the Finnish identity, we have to broaden the scope okay. very much. Yeah. It's not only sauna and, and whatever. Traditions. Yeah. Yes, this kind of council is puku, whatever <laughs> traditions, but, uh, but it has to be widened to, to give space to mm. uh, many kinds of, of being a Finn. Of mm. course, not all kind of, you know, bad criminal mm. ways, but, but it's another discussion, actually. Mm. Okay, well, mm. um, Olga, you have um, studied um, immigrant groups, and, and in Finland we have about 430,000 uh, citizens with a foreign background mm. uh, living here. and, and uh, Estonians and Russians are, are our biggest uh, immigrant groups and um, think about the, uh, we have 80,000 Russian speaking immigrants in Finland. So in your research you have referred to Russian speakers in Finland as an emerging minority. Mm. So can you describe what you mean by an emerging minority? Okay. <coughs> Well, yes, um, you know, in my studies, uh, I'm stuck, to, <laughs> stuck with, the, with this transnational perspective. And transnational perspective means that uh, we are interested not only in these processes that are happening in the country of immigration, but also in the processes that are happening across the border, that are transcending the border. And um, uh, of course, when we are talking about Russian speakers, uh, there are so many, uh, so many processes that are happening over the border that are connecting Russian, Russian speakers with uh, country of origin or with uh, all this um, very uh, large cultural space that is produced through uh, Russian language, right. for example. And um, when you said that uh, Estonians and Russians are these uh, biggest, uh, biggest groups of uh, foreign citizens, this is true uh, when we count according the citizenship mm. of immigrants. But um, at least for uh, those people who migrate to Finland from 
from the countries of the former Soviet Union, from Russia, from Ukraine, Belarus, so, so on, so on. Uh, it is very typical that they acquire quite fastly, uh, as soon as possible, Finnish citizenship. And uh, um, this uh, way of uh, like counting, registering, uh, let's say, Russians, it is not accurate. And I think that Russian spe speakers is more, more like portraying more, more precise definition for these people who have these transnational connections with uh, Russia, with Russian language, with other, other minorities, with other people who originate from this former Soviet Union and who, who also speak Russian and who, who um, like uh, belong to this post-Soviet culture, yep. let's say. And when I'm talking about this emerging minority, uh, I, there are many, many um, uh, developments that uh, can impact in uh, this kind of uh, seeing Russian speakers in Finland as an emerging minority. Uh, and first of all, it is this continuing immigration of Russian speakers in, in Finland. If now there are officially registered mm. over 80,000 persons who have uh, declared Russian as their na native, native language, uh, it means that factually there are more people who master uh, Russian. Uh, this immigration continues yeah. and uh, there will be more and more Russian speakers who arrive here through different, different ways. Uh, there are second and third uh, generations of Russian speakers, our children who, who are born in, in, in Finland also. Yeah. And uh, we can say that yes, this minority is emerging because it is growing numerically and it is also, you know, it's becoming part of, of uh, Finnish society. Exactly. Yes, and all these questions about ethnicity and identity, they are very, very topical. Yeah, absolutely for this minority, uh, also because of this everyday transnationalism, of, because of this, this uh, uh, all the time existing connections with uh, Russia and with other countries. Great. Um, I'd like to talk about another um, my um, immigrant group in, in, in Finland. And, and um, Pavi, you and uh, Tina Sotkasira have uh, have studied um, the Somali community, and the Finnish Somalis started arriving here in the early 90s, uh, mostly almost 30 years ago, and mostly as asylum seekers. So, in your research, um, you have found that the Somali community faced significant challenges in in terms of. Um, in integration. Um, so what, what, what are some of these challenges that the Somali community has faced? Yeah. Well, first I think I have to say that we cannot speak just uh, about one Somali community in Finland because we, uh, in our study we met many kinds of politically active, active uh, Somalis and, and people who are somehow creating a very national and transnational uh, careers everywhere, but um, but all, uh, there's, uh, if we look at, stat uh, at statistics, we saw actually that Somali immigrants are on the bottom of, of this labor market, mm. uh, integration, educational uh, success, and and so on. So there is something that is very much against these people, and uh, of course, I think. Uh, we can say that it's racism. Racism is the maybe the word that somehow uh, covers all all the uh, problems here. Mm -hmm. And as, um, for example, uh, Olga, you were talking about um, strategic identities to, mm -hmm. to somehow to to be able to speak oneself as a yes. bin. Yes. But these people have not this kind of possibilities because. Um, because, um, well, it's, um, it's um, for example, the attitude or some kind of, of wrong representations among Finns mm. 
mm. about Somalis, for example, that they come, come from jungle and they are not capable to, to work or to read or whatever, to count. Um, and um, even though these people very often come from big cities and, and they have uh, education and, and they have had um, uh, quite high quality jobs, for example, in, in their countries, uh, former country. So these kind of false uh, representations are there. And uh, if we talk about racism, we can see um, racism in their lives uh, in, the, in, in a structural level. You see education, labor market, this kind of organize, organization based, institution based discrimination, exclusion. Something happens mm -hmm. when they, for example, try to educate themselves. Something happens because we don't see, for example, Somali mm -hmm. students in our university yes. yet. Yes. Even though we have had so many Somalis so, all, for decades mm -hmm. in Finland already. Mm -hmm. And also in everyday encounters, they face a lot of, uh, mm -hmm. lot of some kind of hate, mm -hmm. I might say, mm -hmm. because we have also done um, this kind of, of observation work among uh, the everyday life situation, mm -hmm. for example, in some small surroundings, some mm -hmm. small towns. And we have noticed how, for example, in one <laughs> town in eastern Finland, they got more than 600 Somali inhabitants. Mm. Now there are 25. Mm. So there was no space for these people in that town, which actually very uh, eagerly wants to have new inhabitants. Mm. But uh, Olga, I mean, you have also, I mean, you've studied the, the Russian speakers and, and have you seen similar barriers faced by the Russian uh, speaking community? Well, again, mm -hmm. <laughs> I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, use this kind of wordings about Russian speaking community because it's, as, it's as Bivy wide. said, mm -hmm. yes, people are so different with yeah. so different backgrounds yeah. and... Uh, but um, uh, I wouldn't say that I uh, was uh, studying exactly this like labor market and mm. uh, how, how people uh, find the, the paths and uh, places in, in, in Finnish labor market. But uh, I participated in the research that um, was devoted to uh, uh, precarization of labor market. Mm. To, to precarious work and uh, this is like uh, um, global development development in all Western countries that uh, labor markets are changing uh, our jobs are becoming more and more uh, like unstable unpredictable short time part time flexible so on uh, deregulated and uh, this kind of development first of all, uh, touches upon uh, migrants and women. Mm. Yes. So uh, we um, interviewed uh, Russian-speaking women about their experiences uh, of this precarity. And uh, actually, uh, the findings of this study were quite in line with uh, previous studies uh, concerning Russian speaking speaking women and Russian speakers, how how do they uh, like find their places in in, in Finnish labor market? And um, there are a few like typical patterns how it happens. One of them is um, finding a place uh, in this like ethnicized. Uh, labor market and ethnicized work, work job and these ethnicized uh, jobs are uh, jobs of translator interpreter um, probably um, uh, sales personnel who who really can use their ethnic background and their uh, like natural uh, mastering of, of Russian mm. so this ethnic background enables uh, getting to Finnish labor market. And this is um, uh, like plus 
that mm. people extract from their background, ethnic background. Uh, other way uh, is to re-educate yourself. And in case of Russian, Russian speakers, it is usually um, happening so that uh, this um, like level of education that they get uh, to get to Finnish labor market is lower actually than their uh, education that was received in uh, Russia or in, in the former Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And in case of Russian-speaking women, it quite often happens in such a way that uh, they change the um, uh, profession, uh, the occupation from uh, like manly mm. engineer, for example, to womanly uh, nurse. Okay. So uh, a very typical, typical again path that is. Um, uh, provided, suggested uh, to Russian-speaking immigrants and to other immigrants, to other immigrant women, mm -hmm. is to uh, educate themselves, to re-educate themselves to this hoidotur, to nursing, nursing work. Yeah. Uh, and uh, all these works, all these jobs are very unstable. Absolutely. So, uh, People, yes, they, they uh, find their, their jobs, but they are not very sure, very, very satisfied mm. with their situation. Okay. Um, we've not touched a little bit on integration. And, and Baby, mm -hmm. what, what, what does it fundamentally mean, uh, in integration? And, and then also, I. We'll follow that up with another question or a concept of inclusion. inclusion. So what, what is integration, inclusion, and, and how, how do they link to each other? Okay. Well, you said fundamentally. I uh, have no fundamental <laughs> answer to that. <laughs> but um, actually, when we were coming here, uh, driving, I was reading uh, one dissertation manuscript of my uh, postgraduate student, Ville Samoli Haverinen, I want to say his name here, because he's uh, making a dissertation now concerning the, the concept of integration, politics of integration, action of, of integration. And from that manuscript, uh, I asked him if I can say it here, and, and uh, there was this kind of uh, pair of concepts that uh, my um, integration can be seen as a politics of lacking lacking, um, lacking um, language skills, labor market skills, uh, educational skills, attitude, and so on. So integration is some kind of, of political project targeted to immigrants who don't have this kind of skills. It's, it's, it's a political process and, and project. Uh, it's um, in, uh, in law and it's um, targeted to certain kind of people. Not all immigrants are somehow targeted for integration. Mm -hmm. For example, you are not. You, you have, haven't been. When I came yes. here, there were no oh, integration yeah, but politics. Yeah, but I know that you... <laughs> in the beginning you of the 90s. Anyhow, yeah. Because it's integration is um, it's, um, some kind of, of administrative and governmental uh, concept uh, developed for uh, Migrant, migrant people, at least in Finland, in, mm. to, developed for migrant people who are somehow need for uh, some kind of socio-economic uh, mm -hmm. support. Mm -hmm. And um, somehow it, we can see it as a very normative project also. You, um, you have to develop these and these and these kind of skills so that, uh, that you become a certain kind of, of member in, in the society. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think we should now check uh, the press MO for the chat mm. because um, <laughs> our viewers have uh, possibility to ask questions. And there's a question here for Olga, and it asks, um, and well, it's finished, so I'm going to quickly translate this. But it says, "What do you think about uh, uh, multiculturalism and national memory?" Kansallisesta oh. muistista. Uh -huh. <laughs> Multiculturalism. Again, 
this is so, so large concept and so, so large discussion about this multiculturalism. And um, um, we can see our society where we live as a palette, palette of different units, of different cultures. And I think this is very, very like mundane and typical understanding of multiculturalism. Mm. But we also can uh, understand this multiculturalism, multicultural condition as, um, you know, uh, creative process, as, as a dialogue that involves these beautiful possibilities of developing something new and a lot of conflicts also. Mm. And, uh, and uh, we need to um, develop these ways of living that we understand that this is, this is normal. Yeah. This is normal. This changing uh, cultural environment is normal. And we, we need to develop our ability to, to, to live in this changing condition. And, um, I don't know, this um, conversation on, on conviviality, for example, uh, that is like one uh, of visions, one of um, options to understand this multicultural condition, or, or diversity, or super diversity. Yeah. They, they develop this further. And um, one of these uh, understandings of this conviviality being uh, indifferent to difference, for example. Probably this would be um, one way to, to live in, in this condition. Mm. And uh, if we're talking about this <laughs> national memory, this council in Amorsti, again, it is, it is a very wide conversation. And uh, this is uh, a field that I'm very interested in because of its transnational character also. And um, this politics of memory, politics of national memory, uh, they developed actually within uh, these national projects in, in national states and uh, developed also these um, ways of uh, seeing uh, nations with their particular, particular um, pasts and ways to present this past also. And these ways, these quite old ways uh, of understanding and presenting past, they, sur they are surrounding us in, in our present, which is, again, this multicultural, changing, multi-ethnic, so on, so on. And of course, uh, what we see and uh, uh, what we hear, what we bump in, probably, again, may, may um, cause conflicts, different conflicts. Mm -hmm. And uh, contemporary situation that is uh, occurring now in this Finnish-Russian transnational space is quite conflictual, mm -hmm. actually, with uh, all these um, memories of uh, the Second World War. Mm -hmm and um, uh, Stalinist terror, mm. you know, yes. Yes, absolutely. I think that many a time when we um, have discussions with, 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 with Finns, we eventually get to the war. <laughs> so mm. At, some, at mm. some point, we all, even here, we got <laughs> to the war. Um, but, um, um, Pavi, while we're on this, um, um, topic of uh, immigration, integration, inclusion, um, language mm. is, um, I think, something that's been talked about a lot, especially right now, uh, currently, and um, especially Finnish language skills. And you mentioned the labor market and how difficult it is for, um, for instance, uh, the Somalis and, and other immigrants as well to get into the, 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 the labor market. Mm. And even I think our, our students that graduate from higher education in Finland have a really difficult time 
entering the Finnish labour market. Now, what are your thoughts on the specifically immigrant, the level of Finnish language skills, and and um, whether it's a it's actually a barrier for them to to enter the labour market, and is is um, are the Finnish language skills um, really such a big deal? I think they have been made a big deal, mm. as you as you said. Uh, it seems that they have some kind of of selective power in, in labour market. Uh, actually, also in educational, mm. you know, markets of education. Uh, this is a hard question for me because I'm some kind of, of language lover. And I'm very strict when <laughs> reading students' papers, and then I feel somehow shamed because um, I still think that we, in a multicultural society, in that paletti, mm -hmm. we should uh, give space to different ways to speak Finnish, mm -hmm. and and we can, um, at least in uh, in our uh, working community, we use very flex flex flexible ways to use languages. To, to speak, um, what is this, Finglish, mm. or, or some Russian words, or, or whatever, and, and we can do it. Uh, so I think um, we should somehow make the, mm, make the barrier much lower, because mm. there's so much what we can do without uh, some kind of perfect Finnish language mm. skills. Um, so I would now, um, yeah, this, uh, following this, this up uh, really on the, on, the, on the Finnish language skills, um, the Finnish uh, employers actually do make this um, very often in their recruitment processes. Uh, they want fluent Finnish, or mm. the other word is Suyova. Uh, Suyova Finnish language mm. skills. I have problems translating the Suyova because it means that you can get by. But what what does that actually mean, really? That um, what what would be that for the for immigrants when they read those recruitment um, ads and they find that they're being asked for so you are mm -hmm. Finnish language skills, so you can get by. How, how does that really impact on 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 them going into um, following up on those uh, recruitment processes, and and how does that impact on their employability? And uh, and does this requirement mm -hmm. uh, marginalize immigrants? Yeah, but it, it it's some kind of of act of exclusion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Quite simply, I think so. Yeah, yeah, yeah me too. And actually, uh, I have experienced it <laughs> myself also. Oh, uh, yes. Mm. Uh, it's it it doesn't uh, it's not connected with this um, situation of uh, finding employment or something like that. But I I wrote something, some comment to the local newspaper Kar Karjala. <laughs> it was critical comment, mm. of course, <laughs> and I received. Next day, um, uh, an email telling me that you should first learn Finnish language <laughs> and yeah, after. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. yes, it is. It is. But think about this situation. Yeah. I'm here as a some kind of expert. I don't have Suyuva English. Oh, you do. I, I, do. <laughs> yeah. I, just, I think we speak languages quite, uh, you know, fluidly and. Um, uh, you know, it's it's a way that we can com yes, you know communicate exactly, the exactly. way you can. Mm, yeah. But I want to pick up on a comment that um, Olga said. He said, uh, "Being indifferent to differences," mm. which which uh, sounds sounds nice. Um, <laughs> but on the other hand, um, what do you think? Would that also marginalise? Uh, people, when you are indifferent to their indifference, uh, to their differences, or should we also accept the differences mm -hmm. that we have? <sighs> well, or I rather, think this being an indifferent to differences is uh, a way of accepting them. Okay. 
of course. It's accepting everyone the way she or he is, actually. Not, not seeing uh, people through their differences, mm -hmm. but seeing them and being in touch with them as persons, as, as somebody who, some ones who are in, in our common space. Mm -hmm. And actually, again, about this situation, before, mm -hmm. before <laughs> this situation, before, before starting streaming, we were talking about uh, our English languages. And I wrote to you that, well, I'm not sure if uh, I'm capable to, <laughs> to speak English. But of course, it is also like, I think it demands from you uh, a very, um, uh, like informed, <laughs> informed decision that, well, yes, I'm not perfect. And I'm not perfect in, in any language. Mm -hmm. I'm not perfect in English, not perfect in Finnish. Maybe more or less perfect in Russian, but my Russian is rusty already. I don't speak this language that people speak now in, in Russia, because although Yes, I am involved in uh, mediatized connections, but I don't, I don't use it in, in such a way. Yeah. What, is, what is my identity? What is my ethnicity when I'm not, not perfect in, in any? Mm. Mm. But if you, if you highlight all the time the difference, mm. you, can, you can put them um, as a political uh, tool. Yes. Mm. yes, yes, yes. And exclude people yes. because of culture or whatever, yes. language or yes. so. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, Olga, in your, your research, uh, you've also uh, discussed the role of media. Actually, I, I <laughs> thought of that when you, you mentioned the media. And now uh, media offers a wonderful way of, of, of connecting people mm. all over the world. And uh, how uh, would you say um, immigrants use media? And, and what's that effect on integration and inclusion? Mm. Yes, <laughs> again, a very, a very large, large uh, theme to talk about. Uh, but um, I think that we have to um, to see this process of mediatization as a very uh, serious process, actually. So our our communication, our everyday life is so much nowadays connected with media and so much um, like embedded in media and our our uh, like ways of talking about the world of percepting the world of understanding of of seeing the world world is um, uh, mediated by different mediums within this large field of media and um, uh, well we uh, um, with Tina Sotkasir <laughs> and our colleague Teemu Oivo and uh, Janne Riihimäki we uh, Riihelainen sorry mm. <laughs> we um, uh, made a research on how Russian-speaking immigrants use media and how how are they involved in media and there are like several aspects that um, maybe should be taken more seriously in in Finland and in other other countries where Russian speaking immigrants live and uh, one of these aspects is this um, like influence of Russian media abroad because in Russia, in today's Russia, this media system is built uh, in such a way that it is controlled by the state, first of all, and it is very um, uh, uh, a large system where you can find like everything. You can find information, you can find uh, infotainment, entertainment, education, everything. And uh, it provides you with a very clear-cut um, models of seeing the world. 
And uh, when people like remain in this kind of media consumption, only, only in media consumption uh, that involves Russian media prod produced in Russia, made in Russian language, uh, it connects you, of course, with the country of origin. But it also like keeps you in this in this uh, space. So uh, I think that yes, we need to develop Russian-speaking media, uh, media in Russian, media in other languages, also in Finland and in other countries, mm -hmm. in our multilingual, multicultural, democratic societies just to enhance the participation, to enhance inclusion, uh, societal inclusion. And again, it is, it is a big uh, issue because, for example, when we're speaking about uh, Russian uh, media produced uh, in Russian language in Finland, uh, we have um, uh, these programs, the news uh, that are produced in, in Russian on Ule, for example, for five minutes, and uh, also um, uh, quite a lot of issues, quite a lot of uh, news uh, are uh, translated into Russian mm. language. So they are there. But how much they can uh, hook people, how, how can they um, become a part of people's everyday life? people's everyday life consumption, uh, media consumption. It's, it's like a big issue okay. that should, should be discussed more and okay. developed. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Olga. This, this was uh, very good and um, enlightening. And I'd like <laughs> to thank you for joining us thank today. You. And um, I hope we'll see you again. Soon. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very thank you. much. Now, Pavi, um, alongside your research, um, you are also running a MOOC uh, course uh, mm. here at the University of Eastern Finland, and that's a course on anti-racism. And tell us a bit about your course and, and what is anti-racism. Okay, um, this course is um, open for everyone. It's also included uh, to our studies of, of social sciences, and it's also targeted to students who become teachers. Okay. And um, actually, it's, uh, the, the course has a long tradition uh, at our department because I have had, I have been very lucky to have students who have anti-racist attitudes, and we have campaigned a lot actually against racism recently, and actually for a decade, I think. And um, then we started to some students who then became my colleagues to develop this uh, course anti-racism and the faculty was uh, positive also towards that idea. And uh, in that course um, there are many kinds of material for students who, who then learn to uh, somehow ponder and, and, and analyze both racism and anti-racism on, on many levels of, of the society, on ideological level, on structural level, on everyday level, on some kind of attitude mm. level of, of individual people. And um, I think it's very important for these, um, for all of us somehow to understand that it's not enough that we uh, somehow act as an anti-racist way. Of course, it's important. But we also try to learn the students to, to, to notice how actually many of them are privileged because of their white Western background. Mm. This kind of, of global level hierarchy to understand it and its consequences in every small situations also. Okay, wonderful. And I, I think that that course is open to everyone. Yes. Uh, right now, and I'm also taking your course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. so welcome. Yeah. Um, now, we have a new visitor, and welcome, Dr. Saheb Khan. And you work here at our university and um, in the Institute of Public Health. Um, yes. And you're also a photographer, and your exhibition, Women Beyond the Walls, was just launched this week. And um, 
So congratulations for the, Thank that you. achievement. Um, tell us about your exhibition and, and what inspired you to um, work on this theme of multicultural women and women connected to our, our university. Okay, so uh, thank you for inviting me. Photography is my hobby, basically, so I, I've been trying to learn it slowly, the technical side, but I got to learn that more focus should be on the story, that photographs should represent something, they should mean something. So the other side of the story is that, that I'm a big fan of how women are currently in Finland, in Finnish society. So I was trying to read and update my own knowledge about that, so I got to learn about Minna Kant. So I got to learn that it has not always been very easy for women, even in Finland here. So it took time, it took lots of efforts, they went through lots of difficult stages. What we see today is a process that we saw over a matter of long time. And the same thing we see in, around the world in almost every society, unfortunately, most of the societies are a bit difficult for the women compared to men. But then I'm, in my job here as a teacher, I come across these students, these girl students coming from so many unique cultures and countries, and they are all so intelligent and so brilliant and so proud of who they are. So this is what I want to show through my exhibition, that women have definitely still lots of room to get more rights, more empowerment in every society, but then we can all still focus on all these achievements that women are already doing in, in different societies, in difficult societies. Uh, for example, here we have two of the pictures from my exhibition. So they are so unique. This lady here is a postdoc researcher in social sciences from Mongolia. That lady is a PhD student from Ghana. Before coming to Finland, I have never met any Mongolian or any Ghanaian. I have never met any Guinean. <laughs> so every, everybody was, is so different. So I just observe and I try to pick up what are the similarities, what are the differences. So these women have lots of similarities with the Finnish women based on their education, based on their confidence, their self-awareness, all those things. So that is what we try to show in this exhibition. Thank you. Now, in uh, University of Eastern Finland, uh, we have a staff that uh, represents 76 different nationalities. And then our student body represents 86 different nationalities. Pavi, are we diverse? Yes, we are diverse, of course. Uh, I was thinking about this, this issue today, and I think that uh, the diversity then actually might not have so much to do with, uh, with uh, nation or nationality, that uh, we are different because we come from different nationalities. But there are some other, or many other actually, disti distinctive features among us. And uh, those features, they can, for example, come from different life histories. If I think, uh, think about my colleagues, for example. So I have colleagues from Serbia, from Russia, from uh, Turkey, from uh, Cameroon. And uh, so um, I think we all are very different. But... Um, it's not always from culture, mm. but uh, if, uh, if I think, for example, my nearest, nearest colleague now, she comes from Serbia, and we have a wonderful team together because I learn so much from her. And I, I learn so much from her life experiences. She come, brings so much new elements, for example, to our teaching and our research. And I think that... Uh, her life history, her experiences, they surely are somehow nationality based. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think they are not somehow obvious to all people who come from that nation. So, so this diversity and this richness, actually, it's not so much from cultures, but from these people, their knowledge, their histories, their, their attitudes, their interests, mm -hmm. their, their 
passions mm. also. Mm. So in a way, we should celebrate that yeah, that, exactly. that that diversity. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, so hey, you uh, mentioned um, any Badbatar from Mongolia who you've uh, photographed here. What, what's the message that you both wanted to deliver from from this photograph? What we, uh, I'm myself a foreigner, I'm from Pakistan, so now I have many years a living experience of being here in Finland. So what I think is that, that what is missing is, or what we need to work more on is exposure to, to Finnish people, of what is the world outside like. So just like a Mongol was a very unique person and entity for me, similarly a Pakistani was very unique, still is very unique for many Finnish people, I'm sure, and similarly to Mongol, a Mongol person. So I wanted to, to, to increase this exposure to the local populations, to the local people, that we are not just visitors here, we are part of your society. This is the time that we are living in. You should stop seeing us as a temporary thing. We are not just passing by. If we are giving you even one day of our life, that is an important piece of our life. So we are actually belonging to your society. We may be having issues in learning the language. We may be not wearing the exact same headwear that you guys wear usually, but still we are as much Finnish as a foreigner can be within our own costumes, within our own looks, the way we talk, the way we laugh, everything. So I want to, through this exhibition, the idea is that, that whoever comes and sees how a Mongol is in her or his natural habitat, maybe a hat, made a fox tail, maybe with too many horses around, with more nomadic lifestyle. But there are still lots of positives, lots of similarities that we can take, we can learn about them, and see that women from that different culture can still be a very highly professional person contributing very positively to the Finnish society. So that was a little bit background theme that I had. And uh, even before the culture, I'm just myself a big fan of uh, history. So the rich history of Mongolia and the nomads. And so it built up like that in that direction. Okay, and, and, and we, we also have a similar group in Finland, the yeah. Sami who are, yeah. have also been nomadic. But uh, the dog is, um, Fusubudu from Ghana it was uh, another one that you, you photographed. What, what did you learn about Ghana? I learned about Ghana and also what kind of was relatively new for me about Africa in general was that that Africa is not just about their skin color or how they breed their hair, but they have a bit too much colors going on. <laughs> In their attitudes, there's lots of colors going on. In their personalities, there are lots of colors going on. And in their appearance, in their dresses and attires, there are lots of bright, beautiful colors going on. So that is something that I myself picked up. So it, it would be very selfish that I don't share it in these photographs with others. So I'm showing that, uh, that we need to learn more about Africans as individuals and also as a society. So Dorcas is one more of a wonderful example that how she is conducting her daily business, her daily life in Finland, how she is a, a high level uh, degree student and what she sees in her future from both Ghanaian side but also being here in the Finnish side. Yeah. So again, she is a very positive and very inspiring part of, I think, Finnish society. So maybe some people don't agree with me, but for me, when I came to Finland, I got to know them as much as I got to know the, my fellow Finns, right? The white Finns, let's put it like that. <laughs> so for me, they are all equally Finns. This is the time that we are living in. So. Okay. Well, now, our time together is now drawing to an end. So I would like to thank you, Pavi, thank you. Mr. Sahib, and Olga once more for joining us and sharing your research with us. Now, last but not least, our dear viewers, thank you for watching from wherever you've been uh, watching. And um, 
Our next Smart Cafe will be on the 3rd of November at 3 p.m. and we'll be discussing the environmental effects on brain health in Finnish, so ympäristövaikutukset aivoterveyteen. So welcome to that tervetuloa siihen. So for now, have a good evening, be safe, wash your hands, be smart and wear a mask. Goodbye.